So welcome, Brian. Thank you. And uh, the two chants that we do, the first one are three verses from a hymn called the Guru Stotra, mm -hmm. the hymn to the Guru, which I do to invoke the grace of my teacher, Swami Chimayana. Mm -hmm. And the second chant is one of the peace invocations, Shanti mantras from the, the Vedas that invokes that our study is well done together. I can give you copies of those afterward if you like. So uh, because we have a new person, a little bit of context. So uh, do you know anything about this text, the Bhagavad Gita? Yes. Okay, so you know what the central story is about. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. So we're in the 18th chapter all the way at the end. Okay. So Gita teaches on three levels, not so much simultaneously, but they're braided like the various strands. Uh, strands and threads make a thrance, okay, of, of, a, of a rope. There, it's a dharma shastra, so it teaches us right way to live and think. We can read Gita, identify with Arjuna, our spiritual every person, the questing uh, sada, the seeker after a liberation, the mamukshu. And then you also find the teaching coming from Lord Krishna. And whatever Krishna says about himself is true about the self, meaning it's true about you. Now, this philosophy is called Vedanta. Vedanta, the end of the Vedas, meaning it's the philosophy that's found in the Upanishads and the practice that's implied with it. The thunderous declaration of 
the Upanishads. And we have them set out in four great utterances, Mahabharata. The first, Pragnanam Brahma. Brahman, or ultimate reality, is consciousness. It's not a sky daddy. It's not an entity with anthropomorphic qualities that hates these people and loves others. It's pure consciousness. How do we find it? Or can we find it? The second Mahavakya is I am Atma. Brahma. This self is Brahma. And the seeker may think, oh, that's very groovy. I want to find out about the self. What do you think of the self? What do I think of the self? Oh, I've seen the self go by. No. When the scriptures talk about self, Atman, they don't mean our ego. But we have to start with our own direct experience. So the third Mahavakya is Tattvamasi. You are that. So at this point, the teacher may hold up the book or a glass, or I usually do the phone. Who sees the phone? Do you see the phone? Yes? Yes. That's yourself, the one who sees the phone. <clears throat> We start with our direct experience. And then what's implied in that third great statement is all the various branches and practices of yoga, the most powerful of which, after we've done all the purification practices, is inquiry into that direct experience. Oh, um, who am I? We endeavor to discriminate between all of the phenomena that is known. Find out the nature of the knower itself. Kind of Cliff Notes version of it. It has a beginning and an end. If it occurs in time and space, if it has qualities and characteristics, if it has form, if it's confined to the waking dream or deep sleep state. And when we say dream, we include here all of altered states on psychedelics. Most importantly, if it can be known as objective phenomena, let me should say that's not it. What are you? You are the eternal subject. The scriptures say Atman, self, it's very literal. And our problem is we superimpose on that direct experience all sorts of false assumptions, misunderstandings, etc. So when we go through all the various practices that thin out or purify the mind, we have this radical reversal of the attentive faculty. We practice what's known as Atma Vichara, direct investigation into Self, me, myself. In a moment of deep and profound direct experience, then the seeker exclaims, Aham Brahmadri, which means I am Brahma, not I know Brahma, or I'm realized now. I'm an enlightened being, come touch my feet. I'm a very powerful yogi. That's all bullshit. It's 
Sita comes to see that consciousness, that round being that never changes, that is earthless, deathless. Shivakash, the space of pure awareness. Oh, that's who I am. I never was a person. And we come to see what is this world. We have two scriptural statements that we need to reconcile. One, Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya. Brahman, consciousness alone is real. Jagat. The phenomenal world is mitya, illusory, literally a lie. But then we have from Chandogya, Sarvam Kaludam Brahma. Sarvam Idam, all this Kalud verily is Brahman consciousness. Well, make up your mind is it illusion or is it consciousness? Yes. We have to learn to see the self in and through the world. A person rooted in this direct experience. Our tradition would call it a jiva mukta, a liberated person. Is this Stuff you've heard before. Yes? <clears throat> yes. I'm blind as a bat. I have okay. macular degeneration. So Got if it. you nod your head, I can't see it. Got it. Yes. And I don't hear that <clears throat> well anymore. No, no, no. I'm very good. old. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. So mm -hmm. with that in mind, that's kind of a rough overview of where our poet Vyasa is taking us. So in this 18th chapter. He's looking at life from the viewpoint of what we call the three gunas. Gunas means quality. Tamas, the quality of inactivity, of dullness, of delusion, of illusion, lethargy. Rajas, the quality of Activity, ambition, struggle, accomplishment, getting and acquiring and achieving, and then sattva, the principle of non-activity. All our struggle ceased. In the purely sattvic mind, there's no delusion. You can see the world as it is. All right. So, what verse are we on for this evening? You, you should have Mark confirm. Forty, what forty-two. Verse are we on? We're on number forty-two. Number forty-two in chapter eighteen. Can I grab one of the books there? Oh, please help yourself. Thank you. That's why they're there. You're very tall. Thank you. Yes. Born this way. Or rather, grew to it. Eventually. Okay. 42. Mm -hmm. Go. Shamo damastapa shaucham. Chanti rajava mevacha. Yanam vikyanam astikyam. Brahma karma swabhavacham. Serenity, self-restraint, austerity, purity, forgiveness, and also uprightness, knowledge, realization, belief in God, are the duties of the brahmanas, born of their own nature. So we have to again understand when we say a brahmana, this is a reference to a caste. 
this idea of the varnas, the castes, has become warped and perverted over decades, centuries, thousands of years. We talked about this briefly last week. Krishna says, I am the author of the fourfold castes according to guna and karma, not janma. Qualities of mind, guna, karma. The actions we actually do, not birth. So the Brahmanas, the Brahmins, the priest class, they're the scholars, they're the seekers after knowledge and wisdom. They're the holders of the cultural wisdom. The Kshatriyas are the warrior castes. They are the kings, the generals, the soldiers, lawyers oftentimes. They're the ones who fight for justice. That's their job. and to protect other people. Vaishyas are the merchants. They're the people who are drawn to the means of production and distribution. So if you're producing goods or you're distributing goods in our modern age, that's not only material things, that can also be information, like being an IT. Shudras are people who are drawn to working with their hands. I was hanging out with a friend this past week, and uh, he went back to school, and he got a degree in horticulture. He's an arborist. What he does is he's a tree doctor. But that's physical labor. You know, he trims trees, plants trees, works with his hands. People who are in agriculture doing labor. He would say carpenters, electricians, people in the trades. That would be the shooters. The chandalas which are technically outcast. It's hard to, dis to describe how they would fit into Krishna's four varnas. He doesn't really talk about them. So it's pretty much just racism and classism, essentially. So when he talks here about Brahmanas, he doesn't mean people who are born into a particular caste who have been set apart as somehow better. It means people who act in a particular way according to the qualities of their minds. Any thoughts on this? Swamiji used to say, you may have been born into a Brahmin family and have the sacred thread, but if what you do all day long is buy and sell and, and work in the marketplace and your goal is to make a lot of money, you're nothing but a virgin. So with this in mind, this understanding of this deeper understanding of the Brahmanas are those whose ultimate goal is to seek liberation. Let's go through these qualities now. So the first idea? Serenity. Yes. So if you choose to live a Brahmanic life, Make 
peace of mind your most prized possession. Nothing, absolutely nothing in life is important enough for you or me to lose our serenity. Yet, many of us toss it away because of a scowl or an unkind word. It's almost a decision. Nothing is more important by peace of mind. Next idea. Self-restraint. Yes. Probably one of the most valuable things we can learn to do is restraint of tongue, pen, and send button. How many of us have wrecked relationships? family, friends, or colleagues because of our inability to restrain speak. The Buddhists have a good paradigm. Is it kind? Is it truthful? Is it timely? Is it necessary? If it's not, don't say it. Restraint also at the level of our activity. Again, the Buddha put forward what he called the middle path. Don't eat too much, don't eat too little. Don't sleep too much, don't sleep too little. Don't work too much, don't work too little. Take a middle path. Many of us have strong addictive tendencies. We have to learn that it's the craving itself that gets me in trouble. We learn a bit of restraint. Then the most subtle form of it, restraint of thought. Oh. Many people think just because thoughts are happening and the feelings that tend to accompany them, I am powerless over them. Many people think that if I vent my unhappiness, that'll make it go away, that'll make it better. Now, Yoga does not advise repression. You want to be aware of the material in the psyche. But it also suggests that the mind has habituated flows of thought. And what we need to do, practically speaking, is thought replacement. We replace afflicting thoughts that lead to patients, defilements, or afflictions with positive thoughts. So if, for example, we are prone to greediness, practice restraint, sannyas, some renunciation. If we're prone to fear, why am I afraid? Well, it's always rooted in ignorance. False evidence appearing real. Living in the future properly. Do not know. It's going to be okay. Absolutely. 
So when the mind starts down these negative flows of thought, regret, revenge, rehashing grievous situations, we don't have a lot of control over the first thought. But we have control over what happens. Many people think they have no control over just dwelling in negative thinking. So we turn the mind to sanskaras, sankalpas that are conducive. Wishing the well-being of others. Practicing ahimsa. Practicing generosity of spirit. This idea of thought replacement. This is called tapas. Tapas is usually translated as austerity. The kinds of austerities of staying up all night or chanting mantras for hours and hours and hours, or denying yourself food, or uh, all this sort of stuff. You know, far more useful is the tapas of being able to have some effort. This just takes Purusharta self effort to move the habituated flow of the mind away from its habituated negative functions. It's not easy, not something we can achieve overnight. Any thoughts on this? Okay, restraint. Next one. Austerity. Austerity. What's the word? Tapas? Shamo Dhamma Tapa. Yeah, Tapa. Yeah. Oh, he was doing Shamo Dhamma with the first two? Yeah, Shamo Dhamma Tapa. Okay, I can give you some better definitions. So, how did he translate Shama? Serenity. Yeah, that peaceful state of mind would at rest in steady contemplation of the goal after having again and again detached itself from the chaos of the sense objects through a steady observation of their defects. That's Shankar's definition of Shankar. What are the defects of the world? I think they're permanent. And more importantly, I think the pleasure they give me is readily available and isn't going to fade. And that if I have indiscriminate revelry with the objects of the senses and I develop attachment, I'm screwed. It's so simple. I will get attached, then I will suffer. So tapas, again, the mind is ruled by the law of inertia. It's the law of inertia. A body in a vacuum at rest or in motion will stay that way unless energy is applied to change. And I think I've shared with you one of my favorite sutras from Patanjali. Tapas Vadhyaya Yeshwara Pranidhana Kriya Yoga. Tapas, austerity. Swadhyaya, the way Patanjali talks about it, means my own personal inventories. An awareness of my own psychology, my character assets, my patience, my character challenges, my afflictions. Yeshwara Pranidhana, trustful surrender to God. All those three together. He calls yoga in action. So this idea, don't 
back the mind. Get caught up. It's habituated negative thinking in its addictive relationship with the world. Now, I have bad news for you. There's no magic bullet. This is what I thought was going to happen with psychedelics. Hmm. If, I, if I took LSD and I was going to have these great insights, and then all of these afflictions would go away. Hmm. And it didn't work. Come down. Weeks later, I'm back in a relationship having the same problems I did. No magic bullet, there's no pill, there's no secret mantra that's going to fix it. It's tapas. It's the hard manual labor of endeavoring to change my habituated thinking. And the student says, Jim, I just don't feel it if I just say those things. And I said, well, who cares what you feel like? Because of the ruthless rule of the mind. Mind returns to the experience that's given it the greatest joy. So what we want to do is give it something more enjoyable. And the corollary. Whatever you look at, you're going to think about. Whatever you look at repeatedly, you will think about repeatedly. Repeated thought becomes habituated thought. I think I'm choosing to think this way. No. It just arises out of habit. And then it sinks into the unconscious and becomes the law of my life. Who here, for example, has had a relationship, a marriage, and had an acrimonious separation? And who felt that I just needed to be in touch with my feelings and get in touch with how hurt I am and how terrible it was and I was abused and and yada, 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 you may go to the psychotherapist who encourage you to get in touch with how traumatized you are, and you go down that road. We've just done that. Did it work? I think understanding can be helpful if we're in denial, but in the end, we have to put it behind us. And change the thinking. This is why in many of the 12 step traditions, if there's somebody who you're really angry at or that's hurt you badly, the uh, sponsor will give you the assignment pray for the person for 30 days. What? I can't stand that person. Pray for their happiness, pray for their well being. Well, I don't feel it. Doesn't matter. Start by just saying the words, but do it every day. Time, the mind changes. This is tough. This is tough. Any thoughts on this? Next idea. Purity. Sauchum. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the the external meaning of sauchum here is uh, cleanliness. So just out of compassion for the rest of us, bathe regularly. Keep your house clean. 
there's a relationship, for example, between your environment and your mind state. If you're a slob and your dishes aren't done and the house is a mess and you never make your bed and there's dirty clothes everywhere, it can indicate that you have some habituated slovenliness in your thinking. One of the things that will help develop the discipline, make your bed every day, just start with that. Do your best to not go to bed with a sink full of dishes or depending on your, your habit, first thing in the morning, do the dishes. Pick up the house. It's conducive to a purer, cleaner, softly state of mind. Work on purity of thought. Spend some time reading scripture. Spend some time prayer and meditation. Where's the greatest saucham purity? Again, if you have pure water, it means the things that are not water, the impurities have been taken out. The best purity is to reduce the frequency and volume of thought. It's not thinking purer thoughts, but thinking fewer thoughts. There are all sorts of techniques for this. Probably the best is put your mind where your hands are working. All right, next idea. Um, forgiveness. Yes. There's an old slogan. Resentment is a poison we brew for another and drink ourselves. The yogi cannot hold on to hatreds, resentments, hurts, It's corroding. We have to learn to forgive. Now, here are some techniques that are helpful. Usually, when someone out there upsets us, It's because they have a character trait that we have ourselves or that we're afraid that we have and are frequently in denial about it. It's another old popular slogan. You spot it, you got it. Point your finger at someone else, there's three more pointing back. Meet one asshole in the day, bad luck. You meet two assholes during the day, coincidence. But if you meet three assholes in the day, guess who's probably the asshole? So here, we begin to look at the behavior of the other person that hurt us so badly. Have we ever done anything similar? Maybe not to the same degree. If we have, what motivated us? And if you're human, 
you will probably find when we've done hurtful or harmful things to others, it's because we ourselves have been hurt or frightened. We're not monsters. We just reacted because we were hurt or frightened. Once I can see that about my own behavior, which may not be the best, I have understood why other people behave the way they do. This does not mean they're right and I'm wrong. It doesn't condone their behavior. It means I can see that they're no longer an evil person. They're a hurt person. They're a broken person. <coughs> Acting in the world from their own trauma, their own pain, their own brokenness. Doesn't mean I need to be around it. But I can be begin to move from hatred and anger first into understanding, then maybe into some compassion and some empathy, and eventually forgive. So when I've worked with people, what's your part in these negative interactions with people? Well, I was traumatized as a child. My only part was, and it was, I was there as an eight-year-old. That's true. How old are you now? I'm 40. And are you still holding on to it? Yes. That's our part. The abuser's not here. The perpetrator's not here. My part is my unwillingness to forgive, to let it go. And a yogi must learn to forgive. Deeply held resentment and anger is corrosive. And if we hold on to it deeply enough, it is very likely to make us sick. We have to let it go and move on. And a big part of it all, especially in relationship, is to look, okay, what was my part in it? Most of the time, it's not, I'm a virtuous person and I'm a blameless victim and they're just a horrible human being. Most of the time, I had a part in it. My willingness to admit that even apologize for it. Any thoughts on this? Jim, this is Sheila. I have a thought. <laughs> I, can, I can talk to you offline, but just when you're talking about forgiving people, you know, I think I would like to forgive my mom for her actions from the dance recital. Yes. Mm -hmm and not hold on to that anger. Like I get mad at her still for doing what she did. So is your suggestion to forgive her? Yes. <laughs> and how would you recommend? Hang on, there's a noisy vehicle going by. Um, through prayer, um, forgive her for what she doesn't know because she was harmed. She, she was in pain. Right. She, 
She's a, an active addict. Correct. She has a disease. Yes. Now, if um, she her behavior is a result of her illness. Mm. She's not an evil person. She's a very sick one. Okay. Now, let's say your mother had cancer and the tumor caused a really awful odor. <coughs> cancer can do that. There was this terrible smell around your mother. Mm, okay. <laughs> Would you be angry at her for that? No, I just might not want to be around the smell, yes. Yeah. Or you might say, Mom, let me clean that wound. Mm. But you wouldn't you wouldn't be angry at her because she had an illness. No, no. She has an illness. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yes, chemical dependency disorder is I think is what they call it now. Okay. She's an effing addict. That's what the, the deal is. Now, that doesn't mean that mm -hmm. you should have unrealistic expectations of her behavior. I tell you, if you invite her to the wedding, she's going to get loaded and she's going to behave like she did at the dance concert. How do I know that? Because that's what addicts do. So you have to be realistic. You need to be mindful. Your whole family needs to be mindful to mm -hmm. deal with what is. Yes, yes I understand. Okay. <clears throat> so you know what the definition of the word acceptance is? The, uh, the acknowledgement of a material fact. The opposite of, uh, of acceptance is denial resistance as long as the family is unwilling to accept the fact that your mother is very ill with substance abuse disorder and right now she's probably not very willing to get help get well she is uh, she we're, we're a little bit yeah she's improved so yeah. yeah okay but thank you for putting that into perspective because yeah. it was hard for me. that's how you forgive her you forgive her because you know she's very sick yes yes thank you and um i appreciate you sorry for bringing it up in class no this is what yoga is about we deal with the real stuff mm -hmm. And we have to have realistic expectations of things. Um, here's a true story. So we're going back 40 years. And there was a young man, a Mexican boy, who had just got past the bar in Mexico. His father also was an attorney. And he said to Swamiji, in, this is what was going on then, this is 40 years ago, in Mexico, if you want a, a positive outcome for your client in the Mexican judicial system, you have to bribe the judge. That's unethical and dishonest. Should I do that? And Swamiji's answer was an interesting one. He said, of course you should. And this young man was quite shocked. And he said, what's your dharma? What's your responsibility as an attorney to represent the interests of my client? That's your job. Now, if you have a problem dealing with the corrupt judicial system, 
stop being a lawyer. But if you're going to be in that system, you do not behave in a way that harms your client. Wasn't that a fascinating answer? So much of what we need to do is be very clear about what the world is, not, not have, have uh, romanticized ideas, expecting the world to behave differently than it's going to behave. That does not mean not to fight for justice. But this young man could do other things to try to end corruption in the Mex Mexican judicial system, but not at the expense of a court case where he's representing a client. This is going back to the shades of gray. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Now, this young actually ended up taking the Brahmachari training course in, in uh, Mumbai. Whether or not he actually became a, a Swami, I do not know. But that would be very different than being an attorney in Mexico. So we have wide open eyes about the world. We do not delude ourselves. And what are our ethical choices? Well, the world is not frequently black and white. Certainly in Gita, you know, the root of the problem, Arjun's brother had a gambling addiction. That's the root of the damn problem. He gave away the damn kingdom on a dice game. Not to mention his wife. Yeah, true. <laughs> Nobody talks about it in the whole Mahabharata. But there he is in a fratricidal civil war. What's my duty? Do I fight my cousins or not? It wasn't black and white at all. All right, next idea. Uprightness. What's the word in Sanskrit? It's Arjava. Arjavam. I don't know that word. Me neither. Uprightness. The idea is we want to move through life with a sense of integrity. We want to be the noble warrior. Act with integrity. Today, be impeccable with today and tomorrow will take care of itself. Don't be a slime ball, don't cut corners. Next idea. Knowledge. Jnanam. Jnanam, Vijnanam cha. Doesn't he have the both, both of them? It has Jnanam, Vijnanam. So yeah. knowledge and realization. Yes. Yeah. So for the person of wisdom, you want to have a full understanding of the highest knowledge coupled with direct experience. So many people will have these wild experiences, but because they have no understanding, you can't put them into any kind of frame. And just it, uh, an intellectual understanding, what we call parokshanyanam, indirect knowledge, 
It's not enough. You have to aparoksha jnana, coupled with direct experience. So the real Brahmana is a knower of Brahman, full knower of the Supreme, who has retired into. Next idea. Belief in God. Yes. Sanskrit word is astikim. So the belief in, we look at it a lot of ways. If you're in a state of your unfoldment where God is for you, other divine being, be it Shiva or Krishna or Jesus, Believe that the universe is a cosmos, not a chaos. There's an intelligence in charge of things. Back to that uh, sutra of Patanjali, the last part of it, Ishwara Pranidhana, the trustful surrender to God. It's all going to work out. Don't sweat the small stuff. It's all small stuff. Next idea. These are the duties of the Brahmanas, born of their own nature. Yes. So, again, born of their own nature. This is the mark of a real Brahmana not someone who just has the sacred breath. Next verse. Shauryam tejo dhritar daksham yutte chapya palayanam dhanam ishwaram bhavascha chatram karma swabhavajam prowess, splendor, firmness, dexterity, and also not fleeing from battle. Generosity, lordliness. These are the duties of the Kshatriyas born of their own nature. So if you are a person who just can't help yourself, that you just can't put up with injustice. Do we have Shweta online tonight? <laughs> no, we don't. Well. We've all heard Shweta share. She just can't put up with the injustice there at her university. There's a piece of her that's just a warrior. And we may know people like that who get involved in things like uh, what Brian and I were talking about before class. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are horrified by the treatment of animals in the agribusiness, you feel like you have to do something about it. That's the Kshatriya, the warrior spirit. Mm. Uh, doesn't mean necessarily that you go into the army and kill the nation's enemies. Doesn't necessarily mean that. It's people who fight for justice. Politicians, political activists, And again, some of us have qualities. It's not black and white. Oh, I'm this cast. I'm not that cast. So let's, again, parse these things. So for a person who has the Kshatriya temperament, what are their characteristics? The first idea? Shoryam, which is prowess. Yeah. So... They work hard, they develop skills. In old timey days, you learn your sword craft and archery, how to drive the chariot and stuff like that. In this day and age, um, so for example, if you're involved, uh, who's a good example? Gandhiji, great example of this. He had enormous skill 
province in tweaking the nose of the British. Nonviolent, active resistance. It's a lawyer. In our modern day, we look at someone like John Lewis, modern day Kshatriya. having a sit-in demonstration on the floor of the House of Representatives. It's fabulous, you know. I don't know what he did. Oh, he was a, a big name in the American Civil Rights Movement. But when there were things that were unjust going on in the House of Representatives, he got all the Democrats to just sit down on the floor, stopped everything from happening. Same kind of sit-in uh, demonstrations that we, they would do in diners. He did it in Congress. It was just it was wonderful to see. We have lots and lots of examples of people who stand for righteousness. It can be for civil rights. It can be for women's rights. It can be for body integrity. It can be for LGBTQ rights. It can be for union organization. Uh, Any time you are a person and what you are called to do is to be an activist in some way, this is the warrior spirit. That's prowess, learning how to act in a skillful way to do this. Next idea. Splendor. Yes. So people who are good at this tend to rise to positions of leadership. That doesn't mean you wear the gold crown and the ermine robe like a king or a queen. But I think of uh, people who heard Barack Obama delivered the keynote speech in 2004 at the Democratic Convention. So many people said, we've just heard the first black president of the United States. people who heard Kamala Harris when she was just local prosecutor here in Oakland. They would hear her speak. You know, they these people attract attention. They have charisma. And sometimes people have it and they use it for negative. but people who are natural leaders. And they can be in the workplace, they can be in government, etc. Now, one of the ideas that yoga would put forward, Swamiji put forward, is the idea of serving. Today in the Chinmaya mission, I think Swamiji would be spinning in his samadhi stall. He's now Puja Guru Dev, worshipful godlike guru. But when he was in the body and he was asked, Swamiji, what's your title? His response was Mukya Seva. Head servant. So the one who wants to be the effective leader is the servant of God. That's the splendor of real Kshatriya. Next idea. Firmness. Yes. Triti. Triti, I was just going to say that. Yeah. 
you can't be chicken. Doesn't mean you're mean, doesn't mean you're necessarily aggressive, but you must be willing and able to speak truth to power, to stand for righteousness and not cave in. Now, a yogi is able to do this because inside he's a sannyasi. I can only talk out of my own experience. My last boss at my last church job, who was a priest, was unethical and misogynist. And he would say, I'm going to do blah, 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 blah. And right to his face, kindly, but firmly and directly, I'd say, Father, that's unethical. All upset because he wasn't used to people being that direct and that firm with him. But someone who's an effective warrior has to be willing to tell the truth. Any thoughts on this? Next idea. Dexterity. Dexterity. Along the same line of prowess, but here dexterity also means you are willing to change plans. You're flexible. So I come from a military family. One of the things my, my brother who's a retired Marine Corps colonel, always says, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. So the warrior has to be dexterous, be able to improvise with what's really going on in situations. Skillful means in that sense. Next idea. Not being from battle? Yes. So we have to be careful about what I call phony renunciation. There you are in a difficult situation, difficult relationship, difficult interaction, and cutting and running is not the warrior spirit. I'm just going to quit. So, for example, the way in which you handle the interaction around the, the job promotion and title business, I think was perfect. That was um, clearest example of not running from battle. That making sense? Yeah, in fact, my manager asked me if I wanted to move to a different manager, and I said no, I'm gonna stay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think that it goes to what you taught about the detachment like, any negotiation or war begins with detachment. Yes, if you want to catch, maintain some serenity. And you're likely to be more successful if you're not bringing your emotional garbage into it. All right, next idea. Generosity. Yes. So the Kshatriya, the spiritual warrior, the activist in life, wants to move through life with a spirit of generosity. It's not about greed or acquisitiveness or acquiring. In the Christian scripture, there's a saying, it is more blessed to give than receive. If we have a poverty consciousness and we're always worried, we have fear of financial insecurity, we're always 
where's the next buck? How do I get this? How do I get that? But the spirit of dana, of generosity, we learn that it is a value to support the people and the institutions in this world that are meaningful to you. Are you charitable? Do you support people and institutions that you think are important in this world? And can be something as simple as taking a friend out to lunch or dinner to donating to the symphony or the museum. All sorts of forms of practicing dana. Any thoughts on this? By the way, for the person who regularly engages themselves in generosity, almost always the fear of financial insecurity leaves them. So you were raised Mormon. In the Mormon church, they have the practice of tithing. Yes. So what do they tell you if you're a regular tither? What are the benefits? The windows of heaven will be open unto you. And what does that mean? Or down blessing them. It's from Malachi. Mm -hmm. Bring unto me at the storehouses your tithes and prove me now herewith that I will uh, pour out a blessing upon you, press down, shaken up, and overflowing, such there not will not be room enough to, to receive it. Something like that. Exactly. It's been a long time since I yeah. read Malachi. It's very close. Yeah. yeah. But the idea here is for them, the Mormons, 10%. Before taxes, right? Yes. And if you start to develop the spirit of generosity, find will never worry about money. It's opposite the way the world says, the world says, hoard it, keep it, put it in the bank, rub, rub your hands over it, and don't spend, don't give. All right, next idea. Lordliness. Yes. So here it's Ishwara Bhava, I suspect is the word, right? Yeah. So the idea here is the Kshatriya finds themselves in the position of natural leadership. It doesn't mean that they strut around with a feeling of importance. It means they're natural leaders. And when groups of people are together, people look to them for right action, for decision making, things like that. Next idea, we're running out of time here. That's it. Okay. Those are the so last two. These are the qualities of the ideal chakra. So if that's the kind of temperament you think you have in the world, these are the qualities to cultivate. All right, we'll end here. Om Pur Namada Pur Namidam Pur Nat Pur Namudachate Pur Nasya Pur Namad Bhaya Pur Nameda Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Pyo Namaha Hari Om Om